again, I'm talking in front of people who used to uh, get the first admission. So I'm a little bit worried about this. So orthopedic people, you know, orthopedic goes first when I started my uh, MD medicine. So, uh, you know, I know that you are very, very intelligent people and uh, I'm a little bit worried about talking in front of you. So I'm going to start with the audit that I did. So when I went to England first time in 2004, in my non-London job, which was in Addenbrooke's and Queen Elizabeth Hospital with my appraiser, Dr. Jane Keaton, she told me, let's do a realistic audit where we evaluated 500 post-mortem medical patients, uh, patient, you know, medical post-mortems, both surgical and medical, of which we found that 6% had pulmonary embolism and 1.6% of them, primary cause of death was pulmonary embolism. Half of them were medical patients and half of them were surgical and orthopedic patients. More than half of these patients received only aspirin for three weeks as thromboprophylaxis. And majority of these patients who are on aspirin were actually surgical patients. And uh, medical doctors were not behind. There were not even aspirin prescription for thromboprophylaxis. So we implemented a year protocol for continuation, and which was subsequently continued for six years with Clexen prophylaxis for every high-risk medical and surgical patients for 14 days, and for all patients who are at high risk during risk assessment, I'll show you what that means. And there is a prospective assessment at the end of six years with postmortem evaluation as well as in ward evaluation. And we found uh, that there is nearly 10 times reduction in pulmonary embolism and 10 times reduction in fatal pulmonary embolism. Uh, because this audit uh, was closed at the primary endpoint, I don't know why these 1.8% uh, people still died of pulmonary embolism. So I don't have that data. But subsequently, this work was taken by King's College Hospital in London by Rupen Arya. And this is incorporated into uh, their national guideline, NICE guideline in NG89. And they say that VT risk assessment we do in 95% of admitted patients in England now. And post-discharge VT deaths continue to fall subsequently over a period of time. And this is a 16-year follow-up of that audit in England, which is recently published by the NICE. So why it is important? How serious is the VTE problem? So if you look at DVT and pulmonary embolism and its complications, the burden of the disease is more than AIDS and breast cancer combined. 6% of medical admissions and 15% of surgical admissions develop a blood clot, of which one-third develop clinical or subclinical pulmonary embolism. And majority of these episodes of DVT in orthopedic and surgical patients are actually after the discharge. And if it is a hematology patient, it's considered a very, very small percentage Actually, most of these cause uh, pulmonary embolisms and death are completely preventable deaths. So how do you risk assess? If you look at highest risk patients are actually orthopedic patients and spine surgery patients. So that all patients who are going through knee and hip replacement as well as major surgery and spine surgery and immobilization are considered as high risk patients. And there are various sort of risk assessment protocol. This is a Padua protocol that medicine people follow for risk assessment. We can use that as well. And if you look at low risk patients who have a risk of development of a blood clot and a high risk patient, if you use with prophylaxis, they match, almost match the low risk patients. And if you consider high risk patient without prophylaxis, there are progressive e events and associated deaths. These guidelines, these uh, 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 slides are picked up from ACCP as well as American Society of Orthopedic Guidelines and NICE, which is a Scottish guideline where our audit work was subsequently published. So we'll go through each factor that we use for prevention of DVT and pulmonary embolism. So what is the role of in inferior, uh, inferior vena cava filter, IVC filter? So for treatment and prevention of DVT, both IVC filter has no role, excepting only in one set of patients where there is a active anticoagulation contraindications, where patients recently have an intracerebral bleed or a GI bleed, and there is a contraindication for use only for temporary purpose. You can use IVC filter. There is nothing like permanent IVC filter currently in medicine. Only for temporary retrievable IVC filter till that contraindication is removed. That is the only indication for IVC filter. In fact, it increases the risk of DVT by mechanical manipulation of inferior V. Makawa. Mechanical thromboprophylaxis, this is again published work from King's College to say that patients who are using compression stockings have significantly reduced risk of development of a blood clot, particularly in low-risk patients. And patients who are high risk, when it's used in combination with pharmacological drug like Clexin or Rivaroxaban, they have almost 75 to 80% reduction in the risk of development of pulmonary embolism. However, 
these uh, DVT stockings need to be thigh length, not a knee length DVT stockings, and they need to be used pre-operatively and continued post-op till full mobilization. So those factors are absolutely relevant. So if you, you look at here, when in high risk patient, if you use DVT stockings along with a drug, it reduces your DVT risk to one fourth, and it reduces your pulmonary embolism risk to one third. So it has so much impact in the reduction of a DVT and pulmonary embolism. What is about aspirin? Aspirin has no benefit in prevention of venous thromboembolism, either DVT or pulmonary embolism. And all guidelines, including Scottish guidelines, UK guidelines would tell you not to use aspirin as a singular agent, even in low risk patients for prevention of a blood clot. And these are the recommendations from the same guidelines. It says that do not use aspirin alone. Extended prophylaxis definitely has more benefit. And patients who are using THR or TKR, both combination of mechanical as well as pharmacological agents have reduced DVT as well as pulmonary embolism. Thromboprophylaxis, so in, now we looked at aspirin, we looked at mechanical thromboprophylaxis. Let's go to the medicines that we use from unfractionated heparin. Unfractionated heparin, that heparin we used to use 15 years back. Unfractionated heparin has a half-life of less than an hour. So if you use it twice in a day, unfractionated heparin, for at least eight hours, your patient does not have anticoagulant on board and hence it is not recommended for prevention of blood clot. However, whenever you use it for treatment of blood clot, you can remember that it is used as an infusion and that is the reason there is a consistent level. So a 5,000 unit twice in a day unfractionated uh, heparin has no role in prevention or treatment of DVT, both prevention as well as treatment. Warfarin, it is not recommended in any guideline to use for prevention of DVT for two reasons. One, it has effect on poor wound healing. And second, warfarin reduces your natural anticoagulant, which is protein C and protein S. And that is the reason it's prothrombotic unless it is bridged with low molecular weight heparin. So using singularly warfarin defeats the purpose of using the drug at all for prevention. Hence, it should not be used for prevention of DVT. Pharmacological prophylaxis, low molecular weight heparin is highly effective. And then whenever you do not want to use low molecular weight heparin, like Clexin or Fragmin, then the other drugs, direct oral anticoagulant like Apixaban, Dabigatran, Rioraxaban, and Fundaparinax. These are four drugs that are highly effective in prevention of DVT and pulmonary embolism in patients with knee, hip, as well as other orthopedic surgeries. However, it should be used preferably with uh, uh, agents, uh, non-pharmacological uh, agents like mechanical uh, thromboprophylaxis. So if you look at low molecular heparin, which is Clexin or Fragmin that you regularly use, in singularly, it reduces the risk of development of DVT and pulmonary embolism in orthopedic surgeries by around 60%, not unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin. So it is very, very important drug. Elective hip replacement. So if you, you are using for hip surgery, it is used for 28 days. If it is not possible to use subcutaneous drug because patient doesn't want it, you could use rivaroxaban, which is Xarelto for 28 days. If both of them are not used for some reason, I'll tell you why you may not use it, then you can choose apixaban, dabigatran for 28 days. In knee replacement, it is for 14 days, same principle. If you are using low molecular weight heparin, twice in a day, Clexin use for treatment. However, for prophylaxis, it's once in a day. If you are, don't want to use it, you can use oral drug, rivaroxaban. The dosing of Clexin is 0.4 ml once in a day subcutaneous. Fragmin, which is Delta Parin, which is 2,500 unit once in a day subcutaneous. So that is the dosing for prevention of a DVT and PE. River Aksaban, this is a wonder drug that we got 10 years back. It's a direct 10A inhibitor. There are three trials, record, record one, and record three. It is comparable to enoxaparin. In fact, in some trial, it is shown to be superior to enoxaparin, primarily because of compliance, that patient, it's easy for patients to take a rivaroxaban tablet once in a day, every day, and it is used 10 milligram. And in both TKR as well as uh, 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 THR, it is found to be equally or more effective compared to low molecular weight heparin. So it's an oral drug. Action starts within two hours. There is no adjustment for weight, gender, diet. Less bleeding episodes than warfarin. Only thing that surgeons need to remember that it is used in patients where creatinine clearance is more than 760. Uh, so for 10 milligram for TKR for 14 days, for THR it is for 28 to 35 days. Apixaban, exactly similar. Apixaban's more data is in atrial fibrillation rather than prevention of DVT. Again, the advantage over rivaroxaban that it can also be used in patients with creatinine between 
clearance between 30 to 60. So patients who have borderline kidney function, you can also use apixaban. The dose is 2.5 milligram once in a day, again 14 days and 28 days for two types of surgery. Dabigatran, here 150 milligram once in a day for prophylaxis. It is found to be equivalent to inoxaparin for prevention of DVT and pulmonary embolism. Avoid in patients with creatinine clearance of less than 60. That's the only thing that you need to remember about this drug. Fundaparinax, all of you have used. Difficulties with Fundaparinax, it's subcutaneous agent, defeats the purpose of using an oral drug, and it has slightly higher risk of GI bleeds compared to other uh, direct oral anticoagulants. Hence, we use only in HIT patients where there is inoxaparin contraindicated in heparin-induced side effect like thrombocytopenia. That's the only place where we use it. And it's used for warfarin bridging and not for prevention of DVT and PE. So, if Ipala, I'm just interrupting you. These last four drugs, if you don't mind, yeah. can you just tell the, the names we know it by? I mean, the trade names. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, Rivaraxaban is Zarelto. Apixaban is Eliquis. Eliquis 2.5 and 5 milligram. Dabigatran comes as Dabigatran. There are four or five drugs. We don't commonly use it because it is found to be slightly higher risk in terms of DVT. And fundaparinox is called, comes as Arixtra subcutaneous injections. It is a subcutaneous injection. Other three are oral drugs. Duration of prophylaxis. So this particular guideline, which is a Scottish guideline, tells you that if you use uh, any anticoagulant for more than 14 days in knee replacement surgery, it is possibly not had added benefit. However, the benefit is significantly pronounced in hip replacement surgeries. And that's the reason all DVT prevention for knee replacement is for 14 days and for hip replacement it is for 28 to 35 days. And if you look at the prospect uh, meta-analysis of this, in hip replacement definitely it has reduced the incidence of DVT from 60% to almost 87% in some trials. Other orthopedic surgery, excepting lower limb immobilization, a prolonged use of low molecular weight heparin is not found to be very useful. And that's the reason in low risk patients like Achilles surgery, or patients who are having uh, non-cast uh, ankle surgeries, a short duration of low molecular weight heparin for seven days, or only mechanical thromboprophylaxis like uh, 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 compression stocking is more than sufficient. Added low molecular weight heparin for a longer duration is not found to be very effective. There are no head-to-head -head trial between these four oral drugs in DVT prevention, however, they are in atrial fibrillation and DVT treatment, however, data varies with the disease that you are treating Apixaban's advantage, Eliquis's advantage over Zarelto is it can be used in patients with uh, creatinine clearance up to 30, even 30 to 60, while in other patients, other drugs, it is more than 60. This is atrial fibrillation data which shows Rivaraxaban is better in those patients. Reversal, sorry. So, uh, reversal. So, if you have done the excessive job for some reason, low molecular weight and uh, unfractionated heparin can be reversed three hours from the last dose by protamine sulfate. Do not use it beyond three hours because it occupies antithrombin-3 and works as an anticoagulant. Warfarin can be easily reversed by FFP, but it takes two hours. PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate. Warfarin reduces 27910. Prothrombin complex concentrate is activated 27910. It reverses warfarin effect within 10 minutes. So if you have a uh, a, a suspicion of an intracerebral bleed in a person on warfarin, they come to casualty, first give PCC and then send them for a CT scan because by then INR would be reversed by the time they reach CT scan to stop the bleeder. Rivaroxaban, Apixaban and Dabigatran, reversal agents are not available in India. They are procured on name patient basis which takes five days. So that is the only disadvantage of newer oral anticoagulant that we do not have a drug. However, if you look at the incidence of intracerebral bleed and major bleeds in patients who are on aspirin and aspirin and warfarin together is much, much higher compared to newer oral anticoagulants because of fluctuation in the INR in patients with warfarin. I have seen only two patients in Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, but at least seen 40 patients in last 10 years coming to casualty who are on aspirin alone or aspirin and warfarin with an intracerebral bleed. The, those two patients, the reason why they came to emergency is because it was used in presence of a high creatinine. So if you choose your patient correctly, these patients do not bleed on neurooral anticoagulants. So in summary, all hospitalized patients need risk assessment for VTE. All patients should be given graduated stockings from the time of admission till discharge and full mobilization. And if creatinine in platelet is normal, start prophylaxis eight hours after your surgery. 
with 0.4 ml subcutaneous collection for 14 days in TKR, 28 days in THR, or use rivaroxaban 10 mg in the same duration. And if your creatinine is high or CBC abnormal or platelet count is low, call a hematologist. Thank you.